Hi everybody, I'm here with David Beebe and Tom Quayle, which you may know from uh, the Guitar Hour podcast, at least that's a podcast I've mentioned quite a few times in my videos, and uh, they've developed an app which until now was only out on iOS. It's called Solo. It's a great tool for, for developing your fretboard overview, finding the notes of the chord and really working with getting an overview of uh, both songs and harmony on the fretboard and uh, in that way really fun to work with. Uh, I've been part of the beta test team that's testing it because it's now out on Android uh, and that's been really interesting for me also because there's actually been one aspect of it that kind of changed the way I thought about how I think about notes and playing uh, but uh, I'll talk more about that later. Let's hear about the app from uh, David and Tom. Yeah, well, thanks for yeah, thanks for having us on the channel. Thanks for beta testing it. It's been a, yeah, quite a quick, um, flown by really, the development process. But we've been working on it nonstop. Um, and after the success and the initial iOS launch, we've had we've been inundated with hundreds, thousands of requests for <laughs> something like that for the Android version. So that's kind of shifted our development from working on new features to just getting the Android version done. So. As Jens said, it should be out now on the Google Play Store. But what is it? I mean, what is Solo? If you're new to it, if you haven't seen it before, then that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Yeah, essentially, um, Solo is based around the particular way that BB and I think about the fretboard. So we're trying to find the most um, efficient system that we can come up with uh, for thinking about how to improvise through chord changes. And Solo is designed to train you to visualize the fretboard based around what we would call the intervallic function of a particular note, how that note relates to the root note of a particular given chord or scale. So for example, like one of the ways that we explain it is, um, let's say you're in the key of C and you have the C major scale, just to start really, really simple. If you were to play up to the note G, so if I was to play the note C would be the root note of that scale, and then G would be the fifth of that scale. So literally the fifth note of the scale. So we're going from one to five, if you did the same thing and you descended down to G, so you're playing one and you descend down to G, although you're going down the interval of a fourth, it looks like a perfect fourth interval, this G note is still the five in the key, it's still the fifth of the key. So whether you ascend or descend, you're playing one to five. Now the way that we think about the fretboard is we're trying to think about what is every single note that we play in its, you know, how does it relate back to the root note of the chord that we're playing over or the scale that we're playing over? Are we playing the two or the six or the five or the 11, for instance, you know? And Solo is designed to get you to think about visualizing the fretboard in that way, essentially. So what it does is it presents you with um, a chord or a, a root note of a scale and a particular scale type, say Dorian or Phrygian or melodic minor. And it asks you to find notes by their intervallic function, how they relate back to the root note. If a scale contains a fifth or a chord contains a fifth, it always looks the same no matter what chord type it is. The a fifth in a minor seven chord looks the same as a fifth in a major seven chord, um, which looks the same as a fifth in a dominant seventh chord. Same thing with a flat seven, for instance. So that's the particular strength of this instrument that we're trying to train with Solo. It's a, it's a practice tool, essentially. It's not a teaching tool as such, but a practice tool. I guess I'll, uh, I'll control the app and yeah, yeah, sure. play. And uh, so let's just uh, basically just see it's working. Let's just find the root notes. So it's set up into this first tab is here is the changes trainer. Um, if we want to just practice finding root notes, you do it, go into the level, select root, and then select from one of the, the sort of uh, set of changes that we've come pre installed in the app. If we just go to let's say autumn leaves and and hit start workout. It's going to present the chord symbol and the intervallic function to find. Which is just the root note in this case. So one is the root note and it's now listening to my guitar. So if I play uh, the C root note, you can see that Solo has detected that I played the correct note and has now moved on to the next chord. In this case, the chord F7, which is the second chord of chord five in this particular two, five, one of autumn leaves. So this might be something you would do when you're first starting out with Solo if you've never visualized the fretboard in a meaningful way before. We actually include over two hours of lessons in the app as well for free that enable you to kind of get the most out of the app. But in this instance, yeah, you can see Bibi's loading up the tutorials there. So there's tons of tutorials to teach you how to get the most out of the app. But if you just go back in again, mm -hmm. so here is autumn leaves again. So if I was to play something else, like I played a D by mistake, Solo knows that that's not the right note. So in this case, until I play the C, 
it's not going to move on. Same thing with the F. So I can take as long as I need, there's no metronome, no backing track, to find that F. And the idea is that you get faster and faster and more efficient at this process. In this case, just finding root notes. The way that we've designed the, the level structure is you can then work through finding single chord tones, uh, two chord tones, three, and four, and so on, right up to uh, various melodic uh, structures, voice load structures, uh, and chord scales. So, so if, you, if you grab root third, fifth, and seventh, yeah, let's work this is through a common one that we demonstrate. Something with. fairly straightforward. So now solo is asking for the root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh for every one of these chords. I hear it wants the one. Now notice it's not asking for the note name here. It wants you to find the generic function here. So the flat three. What does the flat three look like in relation to the root note? Now, of course, you can think of the root note, uh, sorry, the note name if you want, but we want you to think in this very efficient, generic way. So when I play it, it knows I've played it. Now the five. If I played a flat five by mistake, it knows that that's incorrect. So now it wants the five. So there's lots of different ways you could work through this. And again, in the lessons section, we have lessons based on how to limit yourself to certain areas of the fretboard, standard kind of practice techniques that guitar players would use. So you might do all of this in the first five frets, for example. You might limit yourself to certain strings, and we go through all of this within the actual app to help you get the most out of the app. But again, if you're quite quick at this, you know, it will keep up with you. Oops. Case. Where it gets really powerful actually is in the workout options because what you could do is take your traditional arpeggio shapes and just run through them and you might think well what is this particularly doing for me in this case but where it gets really useful is if you come back out to the workout options and you were to randomize the one the three the five seven and this is going to force you to perhaps more, be, think more about the components within those arpeggio shapes in more detailed fashion so if you now start again it's going to present the same thing but it's going to randomize the one the three the five and the seven as Tom says, uh, mapped you know, for the correct harmony of each chord. So it's asking now for the one, the five, the flat three, then the flat seven. So then you're less able to just kind of run through the arpeggio shape in the, the way that you might be predetermined to do so. And you've got to think more discreetly and intentionally about what you're playing. And therefore you're building this you know, very detailed map of the fretboard in a very sort of a de uh, deep intervallic functional way. Um, and as we were saying, it's not just for chord tones. You can play the full chord scales yeah. for each of these chords as well, if you wanted to. So there's a lot of flexibility. There's almost really an infinite number of different combinations you could come up with for working through standards. Within the scales, there's a whole bunch of them. All the ones, without going too crazy, all the ones that we kind of feel like are relevant, practically useful. Uh, we have the uh, so the pentatonic scales, the uh, major scale modes, melodic minor modes, uh, harmonic minor and harmonic major, uh, symmetrical and others, uh, blues scale, uh, some bebop uh, sort of passing note type scales as well if you want to focus on that. It's basically yeah. all the scales that you would use yeah. within a standard jazz or modern contemporary yeah. improvisational context. But I think actually in some ways like you because you now you guys are presenting it I mean how it's sort of very uh, in, a, in a very dry way what you will learn from it but as a user of it, because I didn't, I didn't develop the thing. So just it's like a computer game, you know. It's like I'm playing it, and then, then, then it will tell me if I'm right or wrong. And that factor mm -hmm. of it is actually really fun. And and that's, uh, I think you're underplaying how much that actually works, because I think that's a huge part of what what is really nice about it. Uh, at least it was for me. Mm. Well, I've I've used it to practice and work on things that I am unfamiliar with. So I, I'm particular. I'm trying to at the moment shed like modes of the harmonic major scale. Mm. I also really liked when I was testing it. What I thought, I mean, I'm I'm quite huge on just trying to practice stuff on songs. And I think the fact that you can just take whatever you're working with in terms of basic uh, harmony and relating the the chords to uh, or finding the chords for a song in a certain area or something like that super exercise to, to work with. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's something it does really well. Actually, I, I tend, to, tend to give that homework to my students all the time. I think, I think one of the other things that it's quite useful for is that sometimes just the cerebral nature of trying to keep track of a lot of information is very difficult. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. for example, if you're working through, um, you know, one, three, five, seven, and you're mapping it over all of the chord changes, let's say you do one, three, five, seven, and then you decide to do three, five, seven, one, for example, then you do five, seven, three, one. Just trying to keep track of all of those permutations is quite difficult and trying to remember what you're doing and then map it onto the, uh, all of the harmony. Now, of course, if you're very experienced, that is less of an issue. But if you're at the stage where you are struggling to map some of that harmony out, 
or keep track cerebrally of, first of all, where this stuff is on the guitar, but also, okay, what inversion am I playing now? What's coming first, the third, the fifth, then the seventh, then the one? It's a lot of stuff to keep track of that might discourage some people if they're already kind of cerebral overloaded or, you know, worried about trying to, you know, the pressure, not the pressure, but kind of like how difficult jazz improvisation is anyway, because we all perceive it to be quite difficult. It's supposed to be fun. Solo will keep track of all that for you and will allow you to select particular inversion or a particular, um, you know, uh, let's say one, three, five, seven or five, seven, three, one, for example. And you can practice that in isolation and it will map that over all of the harmony for you. So it becomes very much about just the visualization process and less about the cerebral overload that can happen mm -hmm. when you're practicing. So I think it's very useful in that regard. It certainly is for me. For me, one thing that I, I, I found very surprising with the app, because I, I already had it on my iPad when it came out there, and there the uh, the speed of, of, of it picking up the notes on my iPad, iPad anyway, is not that fast. You can also see, like I have, the app is mentioned in the video I did on apps a few um, a few weeks ago. And, uh, and in there, you can actually see that when I'm practicing with it, that it doesn't pick up the notes all the time. So. So I was not really sort of, I was like, okay, that's, that's fine. But then once I started working with the Android version, then that's so much, that was so much faster. Uh, and um, what that also meant was that I realized that I actually don't think in intervals when I play, I really think <laughs> in note names because I hadn't noticed that before. So I was just, I was just always under the impression that I didn't care. I could just think in both, uh, but that's not the case. I really think I have to translate note names because now I can't keep up anymore. That so, is so uh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So that, that was really for me. That was really like, oh, okay. No, oh, I didn't realize that. So, so that's that's actually how I use it. I translate. Uh, if I have to think about what is going on, if I don't think of it only visually, then I have to translate it really to node names. Otherwise, yeah. So, so we, we we thought about that because when we realized or kind of came across the idea that, um, say, as a sax player, you could use it because of the the microphone, obviously. Well, of course, sax players you know, you're thinking note names because it isn't a visual instrument in the same way. You're not learning a scale shape that you can then transpose up and down in the same way as a guitar player would. Um, but if you think about the the Coltrane method or some of the kind of Jerry Bagonzi has Which entire... We, we have those in here, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Those, we have this kind of this kind of uh, Jerry Bagonzi thing with like melodic the, structures. The one, um, two, three, fives, all of these things um, that people practice on giant yeah. steps. Yeah. What people are doing... Um, you know, if they're, if they're non-string based instruments where you can't do this kind of, you know, a fifth looks a certain way or a fourth looks a certain way visually on the, on the instrument, it doesn't matter what the key is or what the chord is, it always looks the same way within an octave. They're translating, I presume, from the note name through to the interval structure. So in that way, I think that's a, you know, a, a perfectly valid way of using solo as you found, Jens, you know, you can do the translation layer and it's no, no it's, definitely it's, i think i think but that's, that's true and that's also i mean that's just how we usually communicate with the people like i don't usually talk to that much to guitar players i I'm, i play with other people that play other instruments most of the time so yeah. so when i'm talking about music and it's not a student then we're talking note names exactly and that actually yeah. but the only difference is just that for me i mean I, i'd realized that i had to sort of if i have to read the in the number as the interval then i have to sort of connect it to it. but for me it's also just it's an aware, awareness thing it's like uh, when I'm in a key and I'm thinking a note name and, and I have a chord also, then I know, I know both kind of, I, I have like two points mm -hmm. of data on it. I have like what it is in the key and I have what it is against the chord. And it is, I mean, both are extremely important. You need to know if you're improvising over chords, how to hit the third of a chord or how to hit the fifth. And, and that's what you train with this. That's what you definitely need to work out, you know. So, so I, I was going to uh, say, think, yeah, there's, there's like a, a dual layer translation that you know, jazz musicians and, and musicians generally can talk in both ways. So if you said, you know, if you were doing a, a rehearsal and you said to the piano player, um, can you put the ninth on the top of that voicing? They would do that translation layer in terms of, you know, knowing what the note was. But if you, if you said to them, say it was an E minor nine, and you said, can you put the F sharp on the top? They wouldn't bat an eyelid if you said it either way. If you said put the nine on the top, if you said put the F sharp on the top, they would be fine with both. And I think that's quite an important skill set that musicians need they need to be able to do both of those things so yeah it's really useful yeah exactly to and that was and that was and that was why i was always apparently slightly arrogant about it thinking that i could just think in both without having any 
issue, <laughs> but it turns out that I'm better well, at thinking note names. Well, it's that's really interesting that's, because I'm literally the the opposite way around. For me, at least, I mean, I'm, the first thing I learned was classical guitar, so I didn't read, and that's not a very visual way of learning. Sure. So it, that's really about reading music, and and I learned to find notes on the fretboard, and the first, I, I guess, I did learn some like. And actually, on classical guitar, like after a year or two or something, I learned some some basic like campfire chords. Mm -hmm. But like in the beginning, I didn't learn any of those. The first scale fingering that I ever learned, I made myself for an E minor pentatonic scale. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. so because nobody told me that you could do that, like, mm -hmm. and then it wasn't like the good one because it was E minor pentatonic and on a classical <laughs> guitar, like you can't get up there. Because of the tuning I use, this is where a lot of this comes from, because literally, like a six string bass, if you learn a particular interval shape, it literally is the same everywhere on the guitar. So I think I have a, a natural bias towards that very visual nature and that translation layer to, obviously if you said to me, list the notes of a particular scale, I could, I could do that, but it isn't that instantaneous knowledge that a lot of musicians do have where they've literally, I mean, you did this, it's all categorized <clears throat> with the correct enharmonics and so on and so forth. That translation layer takes a little extra step for me. If you took the visual nature of the instrument away, it would be a, a struggle to kind of improvise as quickly as it is for me, you know, now to play over chord changes, if that makes sense. Because that, that intervallic visual thing is so strong in terms of the way that I think about this instrument. And I only play this instrument, I don't play anything else. So I've never played piano or, you know, this is a really important way for me to think. But like we said, this this isn't the only way to think about solo. So like mm. you were saying, Jens, yeah, so you can do that translation layer and it still works really well. And obviously you're so fast at that, that, you know, it, it's just seamless in a way. Well, yeah, apparently not, but, but I think it's really useful. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I have this parallel thing in my, my mind because before I started uh, developing the, the, the cataloging all the two point interval shapes, I did about two, uh, half, maybe three years, really solid work on note names, you know, so, so all my major scales, modes, like just pure note names, my melodic minor started, you know, making good way into that. And then we started talking about this. I probably argued with you for about a year, maybe 18 yeah, months did, yeah. about it. And changing your m m one's mind after you've worked so hard on something, and admitting that, okay, maybe there might be a slightly more efficient route to the destination I want to get to. For this instrument. For, for this particular thing. Yeah. was like a process that, as I adopted it, my the, the curve, the, 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 gro the growth curve of my, my progress in terms of what I was attempted to do went pretty, you know, without sort of blowing my own trumpet, it went, it went quite... Well, I saw it, so I can yeah. blow your trumpet for you and say, yes, that did happen. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> in, indeed. <laughs> so, so, uh, but that, admitting that, and because of that, it was like, well, it was like, a, yeah, okay, I have to, you know, admit that that is for this particular task. It was just incredibly efficient. But because I did all that work with the note names, I, like you, Jens, in this sense that I've got this kind of parallel thing in my own mind where, I still have a very, very strong attachment to note names mm. and the intervals as well, that I find is also very useful in some other contexts and situations. So now the Android version is coming, so what's what's the next thing you're going to do? Uh, well, we have oh. a bunch of, 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 first of all, a bunch of requests that have formed into some very solid ideas. Yeah. And we this is standard stuff, but we don't really want to say what they are at this point. Um, but we have some stuff that would appeal I think, I think what we found is it's possible that solo for very early stage improvisers and people visualizing the fretboard comes in. It definitely doesn't come in at too high a level, but it requires maybe that you would have some direction and, and uh, be shown a, a sort of good pathway through this, maybe by a teacher, for example. And we're going to address that, but I can't say how at this stage. Or I don't want to say how. But all of the big things that people have requested we've take we're taking on board so there are the common things that we get asked all the time um, that we're going to you know we want to and we put into the top of the list for for the next version and we we have been kind of working around as you know a sort of free time whatever that is but you know to, to put these things in things in place but the android version was being so overwhelmingly requested that we just had to put that to the front of the queue so literally thousands um, of comments um <laughs> it's no, ridiculous. I, I know i know because it was like when i um apologies when I, made the video yeah, where I, well. it, I got it as well it was just like hey this is not on where is it i can't find Which it is, it's like, is a mistake i think that was the most part. common the most common yeah. Uh, comment on that video. Yeah. Thanks for for dropping by the channel and presenting uh, the app. Um, and uh, we'll see what what happens next. Thank uh, you very much, Jens. Thanks for having us.
thank you so much Real to, pleasure. Uh, for letting us on to the channel to talk about it and um, and congrats for all your success as well it's amazing to watch yeah man that's it's uh, really cool been incredible uh, you know as a, as a focus on jazz to get I mean 300,000 you've just passed subscribers that's uh, incredible uh, incredible that's insane <laughs> that's so, that's that's amazing. So, um, thanks for checking this out and um, more will come probably and uh, you'll hear about it and thanks for awesome. watching to the end of this video which is probably going to be <laughs> incredibly long <laughs> and also a really long edit why is that notification sorry Jens just let me no that's okay that's a Facebook message thing right ah, ah that's because I opened Facebook in order to send you the link